Sydney. Awesome. Bienvenue. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the 78th event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Technology Speaker and Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum, and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill and the organizer of this series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Tech Speakers and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory, and so much more. I'm so excited to welcome you all today for the first event of this semester. We have four other upcoming events this semester. In two weeks, on September 26, Christine H. Tran will be speaking on Homewrecker Platforms, Games, Gender, and the Media Housework of Live Streaming at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be a hybrid event with in-person and virtual options. On November 2nd, Dr. Avery Dame Griff will be speaking about The Two Revolutions, A History of the Transgender Internet at 6.30 p.m. East Eastern Time. It will also be a hybrid event with in-person and virtual options. You can find our full schedule as well as video recordings of our past events at disruptingdisruptions.com. So that's the redirect URL. The other one's way too long to remember, disruptingdisruptions.com. You can also find our list of sponsors, including Shirk, Milieu, Mila, Rakef, and more. I'm so happy to let you know that today, tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Indigenous Futures Research Center of Concordia University, and Joelle is going to speak a little bit about the IFRC. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so the IFRC is based in Concordia, uh, part of Millier, um, and basically the aim of the center is to support research led by and for Indigenous people and communities. Um, and I can drop a link in the chat if people want to um, look it up. Um, oh, is this is now is the Q and R. Um, I don't know. Maybe I can uh, send it over to you, and we can drop it somewhere. Hans can drop it into the Q and A, okay. and then folks can read it. Yeah. Okay. Um, perfect. But that's actually a great lead into uh, the Q&A box. So tonight we have a Q&A option available. So throughout the event, you may type your questions into the question and answer box, and there'll be some time during the second part of the event for Danielle Boyer to answer them. We can't guarantee that every question will be answered, but we are grateful for the discussion that you generate. Thank you to our captioner for today, Fenella, for helping make this event more accessible. As we welcome you into our homes and our offices through Zoom and you welcome us into yours, let us be mindful of space and place. As many of you know, past series speakers Suzanne Kite and Jess McLean have pointed to the physical and material impacts of the digital world. While many events this semester are virtual or hybrid, everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. We must always be mindful of the lands that the servers enabling our events are on, as well as the materials that have been mined to create our computers and for everything for this event to happen. Many of us, at least of the panelists, but not everyone, are joining you from Dejoge, Montreal on unceded Ghanaian-Gahaga territory. The colonial histories and ongoing political violences are here with us in this space and inform the conversations that we have today. I encourage you to learn more about the lands that you are on. NativeLand.ca is a fantastic resource for beginning. Now for today's event. Danielle Boyer is an Ojibwe queer robotics inventor and advocate for youth who has been teaching kids since she was 10. Driven by her family's own inability to afford science and technology education, she is passionate about making education accessible and representative for her community so that no child is left behind. Danielle creates equitable and innovative learning solutions for Indigenous youth with robots that she designs, manufactures, and gives away for free. In 2019, at the age of 18, she created the STEAM Connection, a minority and youth-led charity that has reached hundreds of thousands of children worldwide with technical education, with an emphasis on language revitalization. The STEAM Connection focuses on the future, ushering in a new age of education via personal and wearable robotics, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality. Informed by the past and present, the STEAM Connection utilizes traditional knowledge to uplift and protect Indigenous communities with an emphasis on language. Her goal is not necessarily to get youth into STEM careers, but rather to equip them with the skills to solve the problems that they see in their communities now. I'm so excited for today's event. Please join us in welcoming Danielle Boyer. Thank you, Danielle, for being here. Bonjour, hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so, so happy to be here. I wish I could be here in uh, person, but I'm calling right now from uh, San Diego, California, and I'm going to share my screen. 
get that working. Hopefully everyone can see it. Yep, we can see it. You're okay, good. Awesome. I love it when technology works like it's supposed to. I swear it's always a fight for me. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about robotics and how robots can be used to uplift Indigenous communities. Um, we're going to look at this through the lens of my work in language revitalization and uh, wearable robotics uh, through the robot named Scobot, uh, which is a robot that's wearable. It sits on your shoulder and it helps teach kids Indigenous languages. Um, you can actually see it in this illustration here by Sean Vial. He's an amazing comic artist. You can see the robot on her shoulder and also on the ground, and it is the cutest thing in the world. I'm told it also looks like a minion, so if I see anyone say anything like that, I don't want to hear it. It was not on purpose. Okay, so we're going to talk about robots, and um, Dr. Alex did an amazing introduction for me, but I'm going to go over a bit of the details. Um, my name is Danielle Boyer. Um, I'm Ojibwe from the Sioux Tribe, which is in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, I grew up in Michigan, all my family's in Michigan, um, but right now I'm in San Diego, wandering around doing random things, uh, mostly robot things, working with the tribal schools out here um, in uh, Southern California, which is awesome. I'm 22 years old um, and I've been doing this work in robotics and stuff like that for a very long time now. Um, I got my start in education when I was uh, 10 years old. Um, my little sister was interested in science and technology, but we couldn't afford a lot of the resources. And so I started teaching at that age and I'll go more into depth on that. Um, but yeah, I've been doing this for a long time and I'm very passionate about making technical educational resources accessible to our communities and using them in a way that is positive and uplifts us and uplifts our communities. There are so many ways that technology can be used to harm us and used to harm our communities. And we need to be able to not only have the skills to fight against that, but also to create things that give us life and, and breathe life into a community. And so my goal is to basically give our youth the skills to equip ourselves with the resources to do cool things and to be able to decide what we wanna do and how we want to make change or even if we want to at all. And, um, yeah, we're doing that through technology, crazy robots, things like animatronics, building insane stuff. It's so much fun. And um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about that today, as well as just why I like robots. Full disclosure here, this is a presentation I do share with the little, little ones I teach. I teach K through 12, right? I uh, travel from tribal school to tribal school across Turtle Island. And I work with a lot of kids and teach about robots and set them up in schools and robot labs and maker labs and all those things, right? Um, so this presentation is for the little ones, but I get so excited about it and I love teaching it so much that I have to share with everyone and hopefully, hopefully people enjoy it. Um, but yeah, uh, these are pictures of me and my robots, by the way. I, um, my mom like saw my slides and she was like, you don't have any with you smiling in them. She's like, this is too serious, you know? So I added some smiling ones <laughs> just so y'all could see it. And if you're interested in checking out more about the robots and things like that, you can find me on um, socials under Danielle Boyer. Um, I post a lot of just random robot stuff. So feel free to follow along with that if you're interested. I'm mostly on TikTok and um, Instagram. So yeah. So this is a photo right here. I'm the one in the furry bucket hat. And um, I am teaching my very first class at 10 years old at um, a homeschool group. I was homeschooled for most of my life. And sometimes people are like, oh, I could tell. Oh, that gets me so hard. I'm like, you could tell I was homeschooled. I'm like that. I don't know how to take that. You know, like, do you think I have social skills? I don't know. But anyways, I was homeschooled up until the middle of my sophomore year of high school. That is a very, very long time. Um, mostly my mom and my grandma like raised me, taught me stuff like that. And um, I had the opportunity at a young age to teach a semester long kindergarten class to like 20 kids. I was not equipped for that. But the reason why I did it was because um, my little sister Bree was interested in like science and robots and stuff like that. But all the local classes, all the local opportunities, we couldn't afford a single one. There was like a local Lego class, couldn't afford that. Local things, couldn't, couldn't afford a single thing. Um, to be able to participate in the robotics program, it was $500. And that's just not, that's not feasible, you know? Like I grew up under the poverty line, like 
you know, it's hard enough to survive, let alone like do robots and stuff, especially like what, 10 years ago, like it was even less popular. And so um, I saw animal puppets one day um, at the, at Costco, which is like Sam's Club. I don't know, I don't know what people have everywhere, but I saw a set of animal puppets and I, I pulled my mom aside and I was like, what if I taught an animal science class? And she was like, <laughs> what dude you're 10 years old no way that was basically what you said right and I was like no no no. like I can write curriculum I can make coloring sheets I can talk about the animals like a new animal like every class and I ended up doing that albeit not the best right I was 10 I um I learned you shouldn't feed kindergartners uh sugar <laughs> I gave them big marshmallows and things I learned a lot of things okay but I also learned that um while education can be very inex inaccessible to many communities, there's a lot that we can do about it and a lot of um, accessibility barriers we can help circumvent in some ways. Um, for me, a lot of those educational barriers haven't always just been financial. It has also been like a lack of indigenous role models within tech spaces growing up. Like I didn't see any of that, you know, I didn't see resources or opportunities around me like that. And especially for my little sister, she didn't see that either. And there was just a lot of thing after time and time again, it's like, you feel like you hit a wall. Like you feel like you don't feel welcome in a lot of STEM spaces. And for myself, I didn't always think like, oh, STEM, that's what I'm gonna do. No, absolutely not. I didn't even think I was gonna graduate high school, you know? When I was in high school, up until, you know, I joined public school at the middle of my sophomore year, I always feel embarrassed talking about homeschooling. I just, I don't know. It's like, oh gosh, a homeschooler, you know? It was not my choice, okay? Um, I actually enrolled myself in public high school. Um, I lived um, for most of like uh, my high school years, very close to Detroit, Michigan, about like 30-ish uh, minutes away in Troy, Michigan. Um, and I, <laughs> I joined a robotics team. After a very long time of not being able to afford it, of not being able to participate, this was also hundreds of dollars and it was a very big deal. I, my sister was interested in it for so long and I was, I was excited too, cause like she was so excited. I was so excited. I was like, oh my goodness. Like, what if, you know, what if I do this? What if I learn this? Um, for me, I was like, I'm going to be a photographer when I grow up. So I had no idea like where I was at or what I really wanted to do, you know? Um, I get there and it was rough. I was one of the only girls on the team. I was the only native student at the entire school. And um, I got bullied so bad. And I don't, I always laugh kind of when I say it, cause it's just like, oh my goodness, like it was rough, you know? I, um, I was told every single day um, that I shouldn't be there, that people didn't want me there, that, they don't want girls there that basically get out of here. It's, you know, boys club. And um, I, as I stayed on the team longer, the bullying got worse. And it was, it kind of went from bullying into sexual harassment into stalking. I had um, drones that the boys would send to my house and like look through my windows at night. And people who would follow me to like club events and everything like that and um, take pictures of me and post uh, like weird, offensive, horrible memes of me and all these things and, and internet stalking and all that. And um, it was so horrible because I was not, I didn't go to middle school. I wasn't equipped for this, you know? I hadn't experienced the baseline of bullying to then, uh, you know, be able to take on the next level boss type of stuff. I was not ready for that. And so um, when I got there, I was just taken aback that that was the environment that school was like, you know? like. I was like, I heard it was bad, but I don't know, it was this bad. Um, I ended up quitting that robotics team and joining another one, um, which is I'm wearing that robotics team shirt here. Um, and the same type of thing happened again. I was the only girl, only native. Um, it was really hard. Like even the coach would say like, are you sure you wanna be here? I don't think you wanna be here. And it was just a really unsafe environment from like coaches hitting on students to um, people just not welcoming, you know, welcoming new people, welcoming girls. It, it was honestly crazy looking back at it because now I'm an adult, I'm an educator and I'm like, what on earth was happening over there, you know? 
but that is the the reason why I do the work that I do in technology and why I create resources for our youth to be able to know that they belong in STEM. Because for me, like our peoples, they have always been um, scientists. We've always been innovators. We've always been inventors, right? Like to not feel welcome in STEM spaces is ridiculous. It shouldn't happen. And so being in those spaces and, and kind of, that was my first introduction to STEM. I was like, I cannot wait to get out of here, you know? Like, I don't want to do this. Um, when I got to university, I was uh, originally going to study electrical engineering and mechanical engineering, but I did not, I did not finish school, full disclosure. So I, I see some people, y'all here, I, I see like professors and all this stuff. I'm like, wow, like PhDs and stuff. I'm like, wow, you guys are really fancy. I wish I could have done that, but I can't. Um, I did not finish school uh, for many reasons similar to the robotics team. It was not a good or safe environment down to our like our makerspace um, director, even sending us an email like, oh, we don't want to fund any girls projects. We don't need to do that. Like, what about equality? We don't need, you know, female initiatives in STEM. And I was like, wait a minute, like, what? No, we do. And so being in those spaces and just hearing that again and again, um, that was kind of uh, externally, right? Like at school, uh, at university, but I also heard it in my own home as well. So um, a little bit of my background, my mom is Ojibwe and my dad is white. And um, he has for the longest time always said like, women are not meant to be engineers. Like straight up to my face, like said it all the time, would make jokes about it, would talk about like, even in, he, he does contracting and stuff. He's like annoyed with the female engineers. He's like, oh, they don't deserve to be there. I deserve to be there, all this stuff. And I was like, this is such a sad, sad thing. Like, why, why do you feel so upset about this? I remember one day bringing home a box of breadboard. I was really excited. And um, it's basically how you prototype electronics. I bring it in and um, my dad looks at it and he was like, maybe you could engineer. That was the first time he ever said that. I was probably 17. I'd um, already been working on inventing a robot at that point. Uh, the first robot I ever invented, I was 18 years old. Um, I never I never heard that like, oh my goodness, you can do this, <laughs> you know? And so um, my introduction to STEM and all that stuff, it was weird. It was really weird. And I it took me a while to realize that my experience was not uh, I wasn't alone. And that's sad, you know? I, I, since I've been traveling to schools and working with the students, I learned like, not only is the bullying and stuff, that's like a baseline. A lot of people experience that, right? But the drones, other people experience the drone stalking too. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. These kids are in middle school, they're high school. They're getting stalked often, you know, by, um, you know, uh, white boys. And it's insane to me, like, they say it so casually, just like I said it so casually when I was their age. I was like, oh, you know, there's a there's a drone in my yard. That's not normal. I think that's why like tech literacy and things like that is so, so important because kids, they know how to use this stuff. They just need to be taught how to properly use this stuff. But it's crazy to me. It's crazy. Um, so all of those experiences informed my creation of an organization called the STEAM Connection. STEAM is basically in addition to STEM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Some people, they make a big deal of the acronyms. I don't care. My main focus is, is uh, with the integration of the arts is for us to remember that STEM can be fun. STEM should have the integration of our cultures and our ways into how we teach STEM education, because it can't just be our knowledge without the background of our knowledge, right? And um, also the integration of like, you know, cool things like comics and illustrations and awesome stuff like that. Like we deserve when we're creating things and designing things to have a good time. And um, art is also a really good way to pull um, kids into math and science skills who may not be interested in that. They might be down for the art, but not other stuff. It's a good way to get everyone involved, engaged, and excited. So um, we're a 501c3 charity based in Michigan. Um, and what we do is we work to make technical education accessible for Indigenous youths through robotics. 
And basically what that means is we have a whole line of robots. That we, sorry, oh my God, allergies are attacking me. So don't mind me just rubbing my nose. Uh, we have a whole range of robots um, that I invented. Um, one of them is Every Kid Gets a Robot. It's a robot that costs less than $20, is made of recycled resources, and it goes to kids for free. Um, you can see some in the pictures here. They look like little, little car robots. They're so cute. I invented those when I was 18. Um, and we've sent out over 11,000 of them now, uh, free robots. And we have um, over 34,000 educators on our virtual learning platform making these robots, which is super exciting. Um, we send all our resources out for free. We have a language revitalization robot. We have open source robotics. We have comics. We have um, an app we're working on with one of our students that's a, a STEM learning augmented reality app. We do a lot of things to make STEM engaging and fun. And basically what my job is, is helping educators be equipped to bring these robots in the classroom. So I work with a lot of the largest native nonprofits, uh, STEM nonprofits, um, tribal schools and things like that. And we actually get robotics set up at their schools. Um, or set up for the students, or we put on a like a one day workshop. It really depends on what the community we're working with is looking for. Um, and we work with everywhere from rural communities to urban communities. And uh, our robots work on um, overcoming a lot of accessibility gaps within technical education from everything like uh, a lot of our communities don't have internet access. So the robots work without internet um to even have some of our robots are biodegradable and things like that made out of plant materials so a lot of our focus is seeing what our community needs asking what our communities need and providing that those resources for them so we design the robots we manufacture them we distribute them and um on most weekdays you'll catch me like sitting on the floor of my storage unit <laughs> assembling robots. I uh, hand count out every screw. I put everything together. I designed all the parts um, in the computer aided design software called SolidWorks. I designed everything from scratch. I 3D print the stuff and I get it out to the kids. Um, I also design like stickers and stuff like that and make sure the kids are represented through that. But yeah, the basic uh, look at what my job is, is robots. And it is the coolest job in the entire world. And my main goal is to make it so our youth, you know, we see ourselves represented in STEM. We have resources to be able to pursue what we want to pursue. And it's exciting. It's engaging. And it's designed for, you know, the kids in mind. Because when I was studying and looking at STEM, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is boring. Like, please, I can't, I can't do this. So I really wanted to create something that was fun. And you'll see a lot of cute, like, neon robots and stuff like that in the pictures here and it's so cute <laughs> and this here is my lovely grandma i love this picture for one reason and one reason only i am taller than her in it <laughs> that wasn't always the case growing up um but now it is and she she denies it to this day she's like no 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 i'm taller but anyways, this is the first time my grandma met, this moment means a lot to me, is the first moment that she met my language revitalization robot that she actually recorded phrases in my language Ojibwe Moen for. Basically what the robot does, it's got a little face on it, it senses motion, and then it starts speaking our languages, which is so cool. Um, we also have an AI version where it can actually recognize um, speech patterns and sentences and uh, speak back to you. Um, the robot costs $100 to make for the most simple version. It's completely 3D printed out of recycled plastic. It is the cutest thing. Um, and we have recorded phrases from our community members, language experts, um, our elders, stuff like that. And um, they always rock unique elements from our communities and stuff like that. Like uh, mine has a lot of woodland floral vibes to it. And um, <laughs> they're also wearing scarves from my grandma that I might have or might have not stolen a little bit. I did steal it from her. I cut it up too, and um, she's not happy. This picture, she is smiling, but that is the moment before she's like, wait a minute, is that my missing scarf? No, it wasn't. But anyways, um, it's wearable too with the GoPro strap, which is so cool. So the kids can strap on the robot and literally run it could do a roll and the robot's going to stay on. Um, that moment was so exciting and amazing for me because um, 
being able to see all our hard work come to life when we created this robot in 2021. I designed it with two of my mentors who are native. Um, one is uh, Rob Mildonado. He is a uh, Taino and he's a mechanical engineer. The other is Dr. Joshua Allison Burbank. He's a speech language pathologist and he is Dene and Akma Pueblo. And so seeing all of our work come to life in this, so exciting. I'm gonna go more into the technical nitty gritties later um, just cause I love talking about it and it makes me so excited. But we sent out hundreds of these robots to date now and um, it makes me really, really happy. Um, so why robots? Um, I asked, the, the, again, I said this presentation is one for my students. I think when we're adults, we look at this, why robots? We know the answer. Robots are really amazing. They're fun. They can help us solve problems, but they're also really great educational tools because um, you have to, to make them work, build them from start to finish. You have to design something. You have to wire something. You have to program something. It integrates a lot of STEM skills in a very project-based way so that when kids are building stuff, putting stuff together, they're solving problems, they're doing it together, they're learning about design, they're learning about so many different things. And that's why I love robots because like for my affordable robot, that teaches so many different skills in a way that makes it so when the students are done, they actually get to drive around a robot controlled by their phone. That's a very big deal because, you know, not only can, you know, you see the STEM skills, but it's not uh, out of reach. It's not far away. It's right there, right here. You can make a robot run. And to me, I think that is so important when we're teaching STEM, especially to young, like K through 12, making it in a way that is approachable and exciting. And um, it's my favorite part too. Okay. Actually, I was meant to talk over this slide, but I forgot. So we're going to look and enjoy these robot pictures for a second and then move on. Some of my students building cool robots. These are the affordable ones. Um, they're the ones that I'm always building and creating more of. They take a lot of time to make. Um, I make usually hundreds uh, in a batch at a time. And um, yeah, it's really fun. Usually I'm shipping them out to schools and then teaching the teachers how to teach the kids how to use robots. And it's really cool. Um, this, this is one of my favorite slides, mostly because it has a cat on a Roomba. And I love any excuse to talk about my cats. I have three, I have Yo-Yo, he is uh, three feet long and he's a chonker, he's a very big boy. I have Yoda, he's, he's even fatter than Yo-Yo and their brothers. And then we have Rex, which my mom stole from my grandma's farm. Um, he was just vibing and then she <laughs> grabbed him and took him and now we have two cats uh, back home in Michigan and I just had to share because I missed them. But anyways, um, these robots here can show kind of the different principles and uses of robots. Again, this is what I show the kids and I just love showing people these slides. I get really excited. Um, these three robots though have something really special in common and they're all created by me or by people at my organization. For example, the one on the left is the SCOBOT. It's a language revitalization robot. I'm gonna go more in depth. Hopefully people can hear me right now because I am under a flight path. And there's a lot of planes, so I'm so sorry if people can't hear me. In the middle is the affordable robot, every kid gets a robot. And then on the right is Auto Oscar, and that's actually a robot that was designed by one of my students, 13 years old. It's a robot that uh, recognizes, um, like if there's a bottle or um, something like that on the floor, and it's able to say, it drives over it, scans it with a light, and it's able to say, oh, is this recyclable or is it not recyclable? If it's recyclable, it picks it up, it stores it, and then you're able to actually recycle um, different like plastics and glass bottles because of that. And so that's a very cool invention. Um, now I'm gonna show you my favorite robots. So I was talking a bit about like my transition from being someone who didn't know I belonged in STEM, didn't know that that was a place for me, to then now building robots. There was a lot that happened between that process. And it was my fascination with robots that kind of came about over YouTube and things like that. I learned of something called biorobotics, which is the emulation of biological organisms, either mechanically or chemically. To me, personally, this looks like animal robots. I am obsessed with animal robots, and I'm gonna show you some just because they're cool. I think that it's awesome that we can take inspiration from the world around us to design cool things. I also think it's cool we can design menacing and crazy things like car couches and stuff like that. I saw those on TikTok and I was like, 
oh my gosh, I have, I have to do that. I have to build that now. But I'm going to show you some really cool videos that I just, I'm obsessed with showing people. Um, okay, so this here is an octopus from Seattle. Uh, for those of you who have not been to Seattle, they have an amazing aquarium right on the ocean there. And um, basically what they do is they have this breeding program for an octopus. They capture one for six months, they try to breed with it, and then they um, release it back into the wild, right? And um, during this process, they were actually studying the octopus to design a robot based off of, um, you know, their arms and uh, tentacles. And I thought that that was the coolest thing ever when I first saw that, because I was like, this is terrifying. This is the crazy, like, imagine seeing that in the water or something. You're like, that, that doesn't look right. You know, that doesn't even look like an octopus. But I remember just being so inspired by knowing that we can take inspiration from things like that and create really cool things. We can actually take, for example, like inspiration from their tentacles and the suction that they're able to have and bring that to robotics and apply those same technologies to robots. And that inspired me a lot to want to solve problems, to want to create things. And I was like, how do I do this? Like, I don't know how, I don't know in what way I'm going to be able to make my own robots, but it inspired me so much. Um, and I just love showing those videos because I'm like, wow, like this, this was the spark for me. That was the moment that really like made me excited. Also, hold on. There's a really cool, where is the, the drone? Oh yeah, gecko. This is cool too, because I love, love geckos. There's a lot over here in San Diego. Um, they have um, feet that um, have a lot of like traction to them. They're basically able to um, pull themselves up surfaces, right? Because of how the, um, I don't know the word for it, but like, you know, it constricts together and they're able to pull themselves up. I'm not an animal expert, so I don't know exactly how to say that. But um, basically, they're able to design machines that um, were able to pull cars. And based off of gecko feet, of how it kind of constricts together and is able to pull. And that with, see, I should have just played that. Shouldn't have said a single thing. But it's so exciting seeing how they're able to use technology inspired by geckos to literally pull cars with very lightweight mechanisms, right? Another one here is a bat drone. If you feel your eyelid, by the way, that is like the same texture um, and thinness of a bat's wing. They're able to build a bat drone. And again, it looks demented. I, some of the stuff I'm like, wow, engineers, y'all can make some scary things. But seeing all this stuff and seeing that inspiration and how we can use robots, not only to create amazing things for our communities, but create crazy things, create stuff for research. It just made me really excited and, and really passionate about that stuff. Now I'm gonna move into the more menacing realm of things. This is a TV show with David Tennant, but I use this as a precursor to show you the more menacing ones, which are my favorite part of and when people in your life, uh, kids, um, uh, younger family members, stuff like that. Like this series is the one to show kids or even older family members in our lives. Like it's just so fun to show people. I always like to um, scare my grandma with some of the videos. She's not, she's not a fan, but we prank each other. To be kidding me, I can't believe this is real. And um, it's especially funny. Oh, I stopped sharing. Hold on. It's especially funny because um, they also have like the fighting robots through battle bots. And I was just like, technology? Whoa, this is cool. I always show the kids this because I think we get so much pressure to design things that are always supposed to solve something, always supposed to be used for good, always supposed to do this. And I think sometimes we just need to create chaotic things, you know, as long as it's not hurting anybody. But um, it just brings me a lot of joy to see technology used like this, especially because in our communities, like technology is used to harm us a lot, um, especially with like um, algorithmic bias and um, even weaponized robotics. Like that type of technology has slipped its way into our communities. And it's really scary. Like even on the border between um, the US and Mexico, they have been using um, robots that have, uh, by ghost robotics, that have guns on them um, as border defense. And then um, in both New York City and in San Francisco, 
they have sent, uh, you know, weaponized robotics um, into, uh, through the police department. So it's like uh, NYPD robots. Tech shouldn't be used like this. Um, some people disagree with me, but um, I don't believe technology should be used like this. I don't believe that we should be using it to harm others. And so um, it's, it's really scary because a lot of the first people who get recruited to design stuff like this or um, recruited for these companies are actually native students. Um, if you look at a lot of indigenous youth programs, specifically ones in STEM, you're gonna find a lot of the top defense companies, oil companies, pipeline companies, all there eager to not only teach the kids, but also get our youth excited about designing weapons, designing these things. And um, to me, it's, it is a, it's a fight, you know? Like we have to stand up against um, how this technology is not only harming us, but also trying to find its way through the cracks into our communities. That's not okay, especially going through our youth. Uh, who don't know better to, you know, they see stuff and it's like, oh, you can be like Iron Man, you know, like you can, you can be a superhero, you can do all these things, you can, you can design guns, you can design um, lasers, all this stuff. Um, it's scary. And I'm not going to name all the companies because I don't want them knocking on my door, you know, but um, it's really scary to see that and to see a, a, a student say like, I want to work at this company, I want to, you know, design this, I want to I don't know, it it scares me. No kid should want to design like weaponized robots. And obviously there's a line of like, you know, seeing Marvel movies and being like, oh, I'm excited. But then it becomes a reality when these real companies come to our youth programs. Like I'll have a booth next to these companies and they'll be like, oh, you know, you too can design a warship. Oh, no, 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 absolutely not. Again, a lot of people disagree with me. Um, and it is honestly a very controversial take. But to me, I think that it is so important when we're teaching technology that um, we show the, the positive side and the negative side of it and the harm that it can have and how it can hurt our communities. Um, even uh, regarding our languages and things like that, we have to be very, very protective because a lot of people want to use it and they don't want us to have access to our own languages. Um, there was an organization that, um, a nonprofit, I believe based in South Dakota, that was recording um, the Lakota language with several elders and community members. And they ended up, um, when the community members wanted to use the language resources that they helped create, they want, they, um, the organization, uh, which was white led, um, copyrighted it behind the back of the elders and basically we're like you can't use it it's not yours you can't do what you want with it even though it was their own language and we see this type of thing happen in so many different ways there are so many watchful eyes on our peoples on our communities on our ways that it is of utmost importance to be protective and doubly protective of our youth because that is where people go to take advantage of um, a lot, you know? And so that's why in the work that I do, it um, is important for me to do things that not only are about using technology and about the beauty of technology, but also about how to defend ourselves in, in a tech world, you know? And a lot of that in my work takes the form of like talking about things like child safety, stuff like that. Um, you know, the internet is a very scary place. But it's um, interesting to see how this can take form. Um, I also get this asked this question a lot, and it's an interesting question. Is technology indigenous? Um, I get asked that a lot where people are like, well, am I meant to be here? Like, what, what does this mean? Like, am I supposed to be in these spaces? Am I supposed to be doing STEM? Because um, uh, PWIs are predominantly white institutions. They can make us feel like um, we don't belong within STEM in general, right? And um, as I said earlier um, in this conversation, like our peoples have always been inventors. They've always been scientists. Like um, even in my own family, my grandpa, he was an inventor and he made really cool things. Like 
he not only would make awesome stuff like moccasins and jewelry, but he also made a machine that flattened out clay for my mom, like a pasta thinner thing so that she could make clay art and flatten it out. And I think that was the last thing he ever made before he passed away. I never got to meet him, but he invented things. He designed things. He made like cars and stuff like that. And like to know that like that, you know, we, we all have that in us. We all have the ability to create cool things. All we need is like a chance to be able to do it. And so often we're not given that chance or we're met with things like my dad saying, you know, like women aren't meant to be in STEM. That's not fair. It's not fair to our youth. And that's why like programs teaching STEM and stuff like that and indigenizing um, these spaces is so, so important. And um, I'm gonna show you my robot suit. I'm gonna first give some examples of how technology is being used to improve our communities um, because this gives me a lot of hope, especially thinking about like the, the weaponization of AI, the weaponization of robotics, like it can be very discouraging. It can be feel very, um, um, like you don't have hope sometimes, but I see stuff like this, like my friend Bree, and I get so excited, I get so happy. Um, so Bree is from the Navajo Nation and she is a farmer who is creating hydroponic systems for less than $100. She gives them away for free. We're both um, MIT solvers for the MIT Solve Indigenous Communities Fellowship. And um, our work takes many different forms, but we were fortunate to be able to meet. And I'm working on an exciting comic about her as a superhero for kids. And um, it's just so cool to see what she's created. And she's very close to my age. And to see this and like the work that she does in community, it's beautiful, it's exciting. Oh my gosh, if you have a chance to learn about her, Google her, support her organization if you can, like amazing. Another is my friend Angela. Um, she created an organization that um, basically is like, uh, it tests water sources to uh, evaluate um, contaminants. Contaminant, I can't even talk today. Um, but basically, um, it's even more in depth than federal water tests and um, it's affordable and stuff like that. And um, her project became a, a finals at MIT Solve as well, which is one of their like MIT's programs. Um, it was really exciting because one of my students actually just um, did a pitch. Um, she's 15, just from 15 years old. And um, we also made finals for the gender equity in STEM project 15 years old she did her very first pitch for them it was so exciting oh my gosh like oh I'm so inspired um she's the one who created the augmented reality app but seeing all these amazing projects and how they can be used to improve our communities in many different ways right outside of robots right like that's why these stem skills are so important like it's beautiful um this project too is so exciting um this is my friend Marlena she is um, using augmented reality to educate people about Dakota history. Um, I would check her out on Instagram, by the way, if you wanna see some of her augmented reality. Basically, if you do not know what augmented reality is, it's augmenting reality. So basically it's, we see normal reality around us, but we can take something like our phone, right? We can hold it up and then it changes our perception of what we see on the other side. So for example, if you look on the left, it's basically placing stuff in front of reality or stuff that can engage with reality. Um, I hope that explanation makes sense, but it's really exciting because she's an artist, she's an illustrator. She basically makes um, beautiful Dakota art and is able to make it so that you can hold your phone up and see interactive installations in real time. Um, and that's very similar to what my student, uh, her project is as well. Um, I really recommend checking her out as well. I don't have time to show all her videos and stuff, but like you have, you have to check her out. It is so, so cool. Especially if you're interested in this type of work. So now into what I created. I talked a bit about the Scobot. It's the wearable language revitalization robot. Costs less than $100 to make, senses motion, and speaks. So excited. Um, as I said before, I created it with two of my mentors. Um, and I'm gonna show you one of the robots here. This is um, a non-functional version um, that I made just because it was fancy and I was excited. Um, oh my gosh, it's so bright. You can kind of see it. This here is the Scobot. Um, normally we have a face sensor here where it can like sense motion and stuff. This one doesn't have it again because I was trying to be kind of edgy and stuff and I wanted to make like a really fancy robot. Um, and all my other ones right now are at schools and things um, being borrowed. 
Um, but it's got jewelry and everything, and it's very cute. It's 3D printed, it's got heart ears. And um, basically what the robots normally do is they sense the motion and then they speak indigenous languages. They also play um, like music and things like that. And if you look here, you can see kind of like this weird shape. This is where we put the GoPro strap in. We basically just put it in, click it into place, put a screw through here, and you can run around and nothing's gonna fall off. The entire thing is 3D printed, it costs $100 to make. And we've sent out um, hundreds of these. And the focus is um, ethical AI and how we can use technology to uplift um, language preservation in our communities. Basically what that looks like is it looks like something very different for every community we work with. Some communities we work with are like, we don't want you to share any of the language. Um, we don't want you to like post anything about it. We wanna keep these resources for us and for our communities and to our discretion. And that's what our role is whether um, the communities want it publicized or not at all, or completely um, private, that is our job. And another part of our job as well is making the robots customize to whatever elements are significant to them. So often like the kids are like, oh, I want like this type of beadwork done for the robots. And we'll work with local artists to actually make cool beadwork for the robots. Um, sometimes they want like jewelry, they want um, out different outfits, um, regalia, everything like that. Like we have tutus that we put the robots in sometimes. So sometimes they're non-cultural and they're just cool little outfits. And then other times they're wearing ribbon skirts and different things like that. It really depends on what everyone personally wants and, and we create that. Um, it takes a lot of time. It takes 36 hours to 3D print these. We're currently optimizing, hopefully soon into something along the lines of um, injection molding, but in a way made out of recycled plastic. It's very hard to navigate um, ethical manufacturing and making sure that we're not actually made, you know, harming more than we're actually, you know, creating good things too. Um, this here is an example of customization, customization that we do with the robots with the little heart ears. I did this in a program called SolidWorks, which is a computer aided design software. And basically it's like, how can we make these things cool? How can we make them exciting, engaging for our students? Even here, like this cool face, it reminds me of uh, like Tron, the movie or things like that, making it exciting, you know? And for me, I was inspired by Hello Kitty and like Y2K stuff. I've been getting into fashion lately, kind of. And so I was like, oh, I can do this. So this is like a little prototype for a new uh, like line I'm working on. Um, I'm going to share and we'll do questions. Ah, this is me and the robots. On the right, we see one named Bougie Bernice, and it is a powwow princess robot that the students design. On the right, we can see some other robot um, decor that the students have done. It's so exciting. Uh, the robot even has like a little sweet grass braid and stuff like that. We're very much guided by and informed by what the students want and, um, you know, helping them create their dreams the inspiration for it. Oh gosh, I didn't remember I had this slide, so it was like a jump scare. Um, the inspiration for the robots was uh, Tickle Me Elmo. It's a talking Elmo. And we were like, why don't we make Elmo speak indigenous languages? Except we don't have the rights to Elmo and Elmo is low key terrifying. So we decided to create the Skillbot. And um, it started with this uh, illustration that I have on the right. I basically catted off my design from there. Um, for those of you who might be into 3D printing in, in the group here, um, no, it is not designed for 3D printing, really. Like, um, you, 3D printing circles can be hard. It's usually better with squares and triangles and like points and things like that. Not as much with circles, but um, we wanted it to look like a little droid, you know, really cute. Um, the design process um, was very chaotic at first. We were like, we want it to be wearable. We want it to light up. We want it to do all these things. Um, and we made it happen. We had little cool ears, little, you know, sensor, everything like that. And it's been very exciting to see like where it's transformed since we first designed it in 2021 to now. Um, currently we're in scaling, but um, what's kind of disappointing and discouraging about a lot of uh, language revitalization technology and stuff like that is um, there's a lot of the funding that's given to organizations for STEM they, when you say language revitalization, they're like, absolutely not. Um, so a lot of the money that we bring in is for, is from Every Kid Gets a Robot, the affordable robot, and is not from this. So right now we're in development and testing, we're in scaling things out, making sure that 
Um, like for example, with our AI, we can integrate um, better uh, control over like different accents, things like that. So the robot can respond and communicate with more people. We're also putting like screens into the belly of it so that people can read stuff. They don't always have to listen to it. Um, there's many things that we're doing. And um, some of these updates are actually going to be seen in person at the Imaginative Film Festival in Toronto um, next month. Oh my gosh, I'm soon, I haven't started preparing. Um, but if anyone is interested in heading out to that and checking out some amazing Indigenous films, as well as things like the robots and an augmented reality like um, design session that we're putting on, I would really recommend checking it out. Um, but yeah, I'm going to not take forever. I would like to hop into some questions if people are interested um, in hearing anything else. It can be a technical question. It can be anything at all. Um, also, I'm gonna share quickly my contact information. We're always looking for more people who are interested in the work that we're doing and are, you know, would like to participate, would like to learn more. We're always looking for funders and things like that. So if anyone's ever interested in helping us reach more youth, feel free to contact me, learn more, whatever. But yeah, I'm open to questions. Make awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Danielle. This has been such an inspiring presentation. Thank you for talking about the ways that technology can harm and how technology can heal and be an important part of community care. For folks who are, who are in attendance with us tonight, we have the Q&A box below so you can write your question so Danielle can um, answer them. So, so far we don't have any questions yet. So I'll get us started just while people are kind of typing up their thoughts because this presentation was so great. Um, and I'm wondering if, and I know you talked about how some communities might not want you to share if you're working with them, but I'm wondering if you can talk about the rollout of different languages that you are working with for the SCOBOT in a bit more detail, like which communities you've worked with so far and if there's other ones that are in development, of course, while respecting the communities. Oh yeah, yeah. No, um, everyone is okay with us talking about it. It's more just not sharing the specific like language resources and stuff like that. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so we have um, a lot of like baseline integrations of um, different languages. Like for example, like how to introduce yourself, uh, very standard, like uh, basic language learning stuff. But we do not have a lot of um, like full build outs, like full recordings of like a language. Like that is very hard for us to do. So we um, have like resources in Taino because one of our mentors is Taino. We have resources in Ojibwe Moen. We have resources in Dene Bezad, which is the uh, Navajo language. Um, we have some resources in Apache, stuff like that. And we're working on scaling like out a lot. Um, we have um, like 10, 10 things right now in the works for new languages scaling. And I get like, <laughs> when I go to different events and like powwows and stuff, people will come up to me and they'll corner me a little bit. And they're like, you're not leaving until you're, you bring us robots. And I'm like, what have I done to myself? Like, I did not think that these robots would be popular or anything. But apparently, one, free robots, they do well. People like free things. Two, they're very cute, too. And um, that I was like, oh, I really did it to myself here. I should have made it look all scary and stuff. But um, yeah, right now those are like more of our fleshed out languages and we're working on scaling. Again, like we um, are not able to put as many resources into this as I would like to. Um, hopefully soon, like that is what we're looking to do um, for the future. Um, we're working on our Scobot build out and um, we've sent out over 250 of these beautiful bots so far. And I wanna bring more, like it's exciting, it's amazing. And seeing technology used like this, it's so cool. That's so amazing. Sydney, did you want to read the question from the anonymous attendee? Yeah, so okay. one attendee asks, do you see yourself producing more robots that help with other essential indigenous cultural elements like legends, et cetera, other than just language? So there's a lot of overlap between language education um, as well as other things like our storytelling, stuff like that. Um, it often goes hand in hand, you know, like when I was first learning my language um, from my grandma, like it often came in the form of like her telling us stories. And so I believe that it is really to the discretion of the communities that we're working with, as well as to um, what's, you know, best educationally for the kids, you know, like um, how the kids want to learn, how they learn best, stuff like that. Like 
what visual elements can we introduce? What, you know, uh, just spoken elements can we introduce? Our goal, I don't want to ever replace any um, of our speakers. I don't want to replace any time in the classroom. That is not what we're doing here. Our goal is to create a tool where students, they can take the robot, what they're learning about in the classroom, they can take it back to our communities and they can use it with their grandparents and their parents and record things with them and they can remember it and use it. That is why I designed this. It is to supplement at-home learning. It's to supplement community learning. Never replace it. So it, when it comes to storytelling and stuff like that, I want to see most of our community members doing it. Um, but yeah, I see the robot as a cool way to maybe supplement that. That's amazing. There's a question from Charbel who writes, can you discuss the differences between the $20 Scobot versus the $100 version in more detail? Yeah, so um, the first robot I was talking about, I'll actually pull up a picture of it. Um, da -da -da -da. So the one in the center is every kid gets a robot. It's a robot that costs less than $20. It goes to kids for free. It's basically a car. It does not speak indigenous languages, but basically what it is, is it teaches basic STEM skills. Um, and kids can assemble it, wire it, program it, and make it drive. The goal is to get kids inter interested into STEM. And then the $100 Scobot is a language revitalization robot. We have a lot of different robots that do a lot of different things at the organization. The main focus around it is getting kids into STEM and also helping solve problems. So um, yeah, those are the two different versions. And it can be confusing sometimes, I realize, because one time I did a pitch and people were asking me questions about a different robot during the pitch. I was like, oh my God, I'm like, I'm not gonna win now. Oh my goodness, they don't know which robot I'm talking about. It's so horrible. But luckily we did win, so it was all good. Um, so yeah, the center is Ecker, which is a bad acronym. And then the one on the left is the SCOBOT, <laughs> which is, uh, is SCO is a reservation sign for let's go, SCODEN, let's go then, you know. Awesome. There's a compliment from Nico or Neko who writes, not a question, but this person just wanted to say that your work is amazing and feels very heartwarming to see another Indigenous femme youth pursuing their passion, helping their community. So that is so sweet. I really appreciate that. Um, it means a lot. I thank you. I want to encourage more people to write in questions while we're waiting. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the biodegradable materials that you're mentioning with the robots. Can you talk about how you're using them? Just, I'd love to hear more. Yeah, so basically um, we designed a really cool um, like biodegradable kind of substance that's a lot like um, cardboard packaging basically um, made of different plant material and like mushroom and stuff like that kind of melted down, dehydrated and formed into shapes through molds. You know, when you're a kid and like uh, you make paper in school for the first time, like you take all the pulp and stuff and you lay it out on a net and then you dry it out and then it kind of forms a shape. We can do that with other materials as well. We can dry them out, make different shapes and it, they're pretty sturdy as well. And so while it's not a new technology, um, we can use those in many different applications. And so basically um, we've been working on building out our chassis. So chassis is like the body of a robot, a body of a car. And basically we've been using that to create the base shapes for the wheels and the body for our um, $20 robot right here. And that's been really exciting to see because we've been actually able to take um, the like uh, natural plants like our in native plants from an area and put them into it with seeds from that area so that when you take it and you plant it and it biodegrades, we're actually able to grow plants from that. Instead of like a lot of the cool things that you see that biodegrade with seeds in it are actually invasive species to an area. Very, very harmful. Um, you'll notice like a lot of the cool products you'll see that biodegrade, like they had a hairbrush line, stuff like that. They all unfortunately, um, were like banned <laughs> so like you see them on the shelf one day they're gone the next that's why um they're all invasive and so we are working on very localized in areas like building that out it's very experimental right now but super exciting and it makes me really excited to talk about it. so thank you that's so cool um joelle or jason if you have any questions too please <laughs> not to put you on the spot or sydney and again, folks that are coming, please. Yeah, and if anyone feels like um, asking any questions to me, you can always ask through my website or my email or anything like that. I'll put that here. 
Um, feel free to ask any questions you have. I'll get back to you in like two to three business months. <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me. That was uh, that was really fabulous, Danielle. It was really great to see your work, see the breadth of it and the energy and the thinking behind it. Thank you. Um, what I'm wondering is, uh, and I have an email that I've already composed that's going to be going your way uh, as soon Thanks. as we're done tonight. Uh, so what I'm wondering is um, how, you know, you, you touched on it a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to see if you want to talk a bit more about, you know, this kind of intersection between sort of artificial systems like robotics and AI and things like that you know, and um, our people's indigenous uh, sort of cultural practices. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's uh, there's some people, like you said, like there's some people who are like, they're really repelled by that idea. That are right. some people who sort of want to embrace it. And uh, yeah, I'm just, yeah, very curious to hear you talk a bit more about that if, you, if you'd like. Yeah, I get asked about this like a lot, honestly, and it come it comes up a lot because it can often be seen as kind of a disagreement often between like our elders and then our youth, because, you know, like technology is often perceived as something like, oh, young people are doing it. They're on social media technology. Yay. And like even in my own family, I can see that divide like generation by generation of my grandma who's like, ah, I don't know if I'm always comfortable with that. Um, whereas for me, I'm like, let's embrace it, everything, yeah. And so um, being able to recognize that both of us are right is important because um, we both have very different um, relationships to technology, but we have to be very sensitive and aware of each other's interactions with technology as well as the harms that it has. Because if we just go full throttle forward with using tech in every way in our communities, I don't think that's the right thing. I don't think it's the right thing to completely, um, you know, not use it either. I think it's very uh, much to the discretion of like our councils and stuff like that to be able to say like, I want to be able to use this or I don't want to be able to use this. So for me, like I see the robots as something that's like to be used by people who want it, never forced into anyone's hands. Like, I don't want that, that would bum me out, you know? Um, it's interesting though, because we're starting to see a shift of a lot of communities being more interested in integrating STEM into STEM education into like uh, um, tribal schools. That's something that we're seeing new now that is like um, STEM education and specific to like robotics, maker spaces, um, AI, stuff like that. We're seeing a rise of technical schools like Lakota Tech. We're seeing uh, Navajo Nation just now discuss like, should we bring more STEM resources into you know schools? That's a very interesting transition because we're seeing live these conversations of like is this good is this bad what does this mean oh my gosh like you see people freaking out sometimes because there is some fear mongering behind tech uh you know robots taking jobs taking over the world all this stuff then you also hear very real concerns and sometimes one can overshadow the other so I think to me it's important to have like educated conversations about like the real dangers of technology specific to like child safety and stuff like that like hey like this is what me it means when we're bringing these things into our homes this is what it means when we're bringing these things into our classrooms but at the same time like stem skills and stuff like that has to be taught in schools like we are only um setting our youth back if we're not teaching even stuff in coding if we're not teaching stuff in tech and so um yeah that is kind of interesting because i've actually had school boards tell me that they have used my robot in conversations to leverage with their elders, <laughs> putting STEM education into the classrooms. I, I didn't know that was happening. Basically, they were like, hey, you know, like, uh, you know, the elders are saying tech isn't indigenous. And then uh, other communities saying, oh, these robots, look at them. They're in a ribbon skirt. <laughs> like, they're speaking indigenous languages here. We need to put STEM education in the classroom. We have indigenous technologists now to work with. And so we're seeing those conversations. and. Um, it's exciting to me, but it also can be scary at times because, again, we're seeing a rise of like very harmful companies trying to make their move in on where there is openings in STEM, specifically through large native STEM nonprofits. So I won't name drop, but yeah, it's it's hard to answer that, you know, like it's a whole it's a whole thing, as you know. <laughs> That's a great answer. Thank you. It's not really an answer. <laughs> 
definitely a conversation, but yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. And I definitely could talk about it for like a year, probably. Carol, did you want to ask something? Or if not, um, Sydney might be able to ask the, read the next question. Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question before. Um, basically, I was wondering about, uh, is there like such thing as like ethical coding, uh, meaning that like, how do you see the intersection of uh, indigenous language and then with uh, language coding like uh, that you're using? I don't know which language uh, you're using to code the robots, but um, yeah, more like- Do you mean the, the like technical. language recordings or things like that? Like, uh, like how we're keeping the languages? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like how do you see the like, um, just because, you know, if you just take like C++ languages, like the, the language that's used, the, 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 um, the codes are just so, uh, you know, really speaking of, um, like a hierarchies and all of that. So how does that like um, influence or or not the the way you're building the robot is what I mean. Sorry, I don't know if I'm being clear. It's, this is really not my expertise. Do you mean I'm... like the the specific like you know Java C C plus like, plus? Yeah, like exactly. How what do you mean by that? Like how it's being used like in the robots or like um... yeah yeah how like yeah if we go down to the, like the nitty gritty like how are you using it and. Do you find it like limiting sometimes in what you wanted to do for the robot? No, because basically we're just using it to tell the robot what functions we want it to have. So like I can, you know, code into the bot. I want it in binary. I want it to turn light on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. I want it to do, I want it to play an audio recording when it senses this motion. I want it to do this when I tell it to do this. So it's very much, it doesn't escape from us. It's very much controlled to what we tell it to do and to what function that we have it. So I don't know if I'm answering your question so you can clarify after if you need to, but basically like when we tell the robot and we code it to do something, it does it, right? And so um, we have that connected to like our electrical system, connected to our um, software where we're able to actually like recognize speech patterns and things like that. So maybe you're talking more about that, like the the ethics of like making sure we're inclusive when we're doing like uh, speech recognition or different things like that. That is more definitely limiting in that way. Um, I don't always know how to answer this. I don't know if you mean more AI or if you mean like the baseline coding or like, I don't know. No, it was that. exactly that. Like, yeah, oh, the how, AI, like, okay. That, okay. Yeah, but I mean, That's how better. to make it like, uh, yeah, inclusive and like. Um, okay. Yes. I I, yeah, I feel like it could be limiting and like how you go oh, around those. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it can definitely be limiting. Okay, I see what you're saying now. Sorry, I thought you were. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, it can be limiting in the way that like um, you have to train the AI to be able to um, pick up on different like uh, speech patterns, different things like that. So basically what we have is where we are looking for um, you to say a word to the robot. It picks up on that word. It recognizes it. And then you, it says a word back. So we are, we have more um, like resources for the robots to be able to pick up on English words being spoken, not on different indigenous languages. Basically what we've trained it to do is when I say an English word to it, hello, it's able to say boujou back to me because I'm able to say like, oh, hello means boujou, right? So it's able to connect that. But if I say boujou to it, that's a lot more coding. <laughs> it's harder for it to say hello back because then it has to pick that up right it's you're able to get more um samples of what it sounds like what hello sounds like than what buju sounds like so it's more limiting for the indigenous languages and the resources that we have for that versus then starting out in like english if that makes sense like i don't know exactly if i'm explaining it very clearly but it can be limiting in that way, especially when we have accents, we have different things like that. Or if we want it to be more conversational where it's like, hey, robot, am I pronouncing this word right? Like that is a lot more advanced and it takes a lot more of a build out. So yeah, right now, definitely not perfect. It's definitely more dependent on the English interaction with the robot. Um, we also have the robot where it senses motion and it speaks like off of pre-recorded tracks and things like that. Um, and that's definitely limiting as well. They can be only see only so interactive. So yes, very limiting. Thank you. Thank you so much. That actually ties in really well with the next question. Sydney, do you want to read the one from Vola or 
Vola. Yeah. Um, so Vula or Vola um, says, hi, Danielle, this is Vola from Athens. So exciting and inspiring to hear you talk. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the sources you use for language. I'm also thinking that since many of these languages are oral, this is maybe a problem for evolving indigenous AI where you need a lot of written text to in quotes feed it. Yes, uh, there is a lot of stuff you need it to be based on like written language which is why um, having the pre-recorded type of version where it's able to sense motion and speak, it basically is like a kid-friendly model where the kid can say, oh, hi, robot, it senses motion. And then it says, you know, like, boo hello. And then it says something and it's like, well, repeat that back to me. It's not an intelligent version, but it is a way where we can integrate more like life into what we're doing without like, it being so technically advanced that we're like losing ourselves in it because like that build out is absolutely insane. Um, and it's something that we're working on, but there are limitations, it is difficult. So the pre-recorded version for me is my favorite because we're actually able to like have the um, speakers like write a script and then it, it pauses, senses motion again, speaks again. So I hope that answers the question, but yeah, it's limiting. A lot of it is based on text. I, I think that that needs to be, you know, I, there's more ways to get around it. It's hard. <laughs> so yeah, if anyone is an expert on this and wants to help, <laughs> always looking for more people. I think there's maybe some folks both in the room and who might watch this later too, who will want to reach out, hopefully. Um, B, the next question comes from B, who um, writes about, writes a question related to some of the themes you've been talking about. Um, which is, uh, B writes, I'd love to hear if you have a vision for what AI could be when integrated and developed within indigenous cultures as a counterpoint to the big tech extractivist AI we have now. So if you yeah, want to speak I, more I think to that, that there's many ways that we can use technology or like AI in cool ways, um, specifically like robots and language. Um, also, there's a lot of scary things too, like even seeing how people's art get literally stolen or how a lot of people like um, there's this really interesting article I recommend reading by Native Max Magazine, where basically they did an article about fashion and AI, um, and like AI, um, like generated images. I'm going to talk about that because I was excited reading it, so I'm going to mention it real quick. Basically, um, they were having a conversation about like, should we even be using these generated images? Should we even be able to do this at all? And one of the speakers in the article said like, when these images of like fake natives, like these images are not real. They're not of real native people. People generate a lot of images of natives, of natives in regalia. Like this regalia doesn't exist. It's not accurate. These natives don't exist. And none of it's real, right? It's just based off of compiled images, very pan-Indianism. Like it's very much a conglomeration of everything the internet <laughs> thinks is, you know, like whatever you're generating. And so like, the speaker in the article was like, once these images are out there, they're out there. We can't take them back. That's very true. And I was thinking about that a lot because a lot of my friends like are around my age and like are obsessed with ChatGPT and with Dolly and Midjourney and things like that. And I even use things like Midjourney. Oh, it got spooky and it's all dark. Um, I even use Midjourney to help come up with ideas for things. And um, yeah, like I was using it for tattoo inspiration of circuits. Like I've got circuits here and stuff like that. Like I was using that for inspo and it's like, well, is that okay? Like, what does that mean? Like the ethics are often very much placed on the individual, you know? Um, but it's interesting. And I do recommend reading that article more in depth, but it was interesting to me to see kind of the conversation of like, this isn't real. But um, one of the speakers, Marlena, who I was talking about earlier, wherever she is, hold on, here, she was talking about how, oh, this is the first time I've ever seen a native, like, on the moon, or I've ever seen a native doing this or this, and I was able to generate it and make it real to me. Um, this is all very interesting. Like, everyone has very different takes on it and how uh, AI could either be used to improve things for ourselves or improve things for our communities, come up with ideas, stuff like that. Um, even like chat GPT wise, like uh, it's definitely helped me be able to finish grants. I stick my entire website <laughs> into the chat GPT and I'm like, can you summarize this for me? 
Um, for me, I'm not very good at writing, so it's able to help me come up with like better ways of phrasing things, but with my own knowledge that I'm putting into it, right? I don't know. It's a very interesting conversation. It's one that's kind of hard for me to have sometimes because like I um I see many benefits of it, but I see much harm in it as well. And so like I can see how we can use it to further opportunities for our communities. Um, but I also see how it could be very much like a very bad media thing, especially if people are like, this is what a native looks like. Absolutely not. This is not like, well, how, like, how can we make sure people know this isn't a real image? How can we make sure like people know that this isn't real? But um, actually, I'm going to Google, wait, no, I don't remember the title to it. But please look up that article. It is so interesting. Wait, so Dan Danielle, I just want, oh, sorry, wait, did someone else talk? No. <laughs> okay, it was just a weird sound feedback. Sorry about that. So Danielle, since we're like basically out of time, I was wondering if there was any kind of final words you wanted to leave us with. Um, um, one second, I'm trying to find that article. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. I'm like, this is such <laughs> a good article. It was such a good conversation. I don't know where it is, but Google Native Max Magazine AI, it didn't come up. So you might have to look a little okay. bit more. Maybe look up Marlena Miles, Native Max. Honestly, it's such a good read. Um, I could go more into depth on like AI and stuff like that. It is interesting. Like for me, I think I'm also like coming to terms with it personally on my own views of like ChatGPT, Midjourney, Dolly, all the stuff as we've seen it become more of a widely used thing. It's like, oh, how can we use it? How can we maximize it? But how can we not take advantage of people's work and like, you know, copyrighted stuff and things like that? So yeah, I'm curious to hear as well if anyone wants to email me about it in chat. So I think my final notes is I thank you for listening and hearing, you know, what I had to say. I'm always appreciative to be able to share about um, technology and how we're using it in our communities for good. A lot of times people don't have a perception of us where, you know, like they see us creating things or doing cool stuff. And, you know, a lot of times people see us as only existing in the past. And I think it's important for us to show like what we're doing now, what we're doing to create cool things for our communities that, you know, we're, we're awesome. <laughs> we're creating cool things, you know, like that makes me excited and is the point that I want to share whenever I talk to people. And um, yeah, if you have any young people in your life, share those cool robot videos I was showing earlier with the demented robots. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you. I really appreciate everyone's time. If you have any follow-up questions, you want to know anything more about me, about my background, about my robots, about my work, about getting involved, anything, like feel free to check out, check it out. I can only say so much, you know, in the short period of time, I always have a lot more to say. If you're interested as well, I have a lot of interviews out online. I also just had a documentary release with MIT Solve that you can find online uh, called The Big Idea. There's a lot of resources out there where I'm talking about the robots, talking about the work that we're doing. Um, so please feel free to check that out. So yeah. Well, thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you so much, Jason and the Indigenous Futures Research Center and Joelle for being here and supporting. Thank you to Sydney for helping with the tech and thanks Vanilla for captioning. And thank you all for coming. Remember our next event is September 26th and it's been so wonderful to spend this evening with you. So thanks everybody. Y'all are Night. awesome. Have a good one. Bye. Sydney, do you want to stop the recording? <laughs> awesome.